Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, uh, the event we are hosting tonight, Innovation Frontier of Financial in Inclusion, uh, U.S. and Global Incubator Models. Um, no, it's, it won't be echoing. It's actually uh, just for the webcast. So, um, yeah, but it, it, it's working. It's just going to the webcast. Um, the, so for NIPE, uh, we are really proud to host, we've been hosting a series of events periodically around the area of financial inclusion, trying to connect the broader questions of financial services to this, uh, the field and how it's evolving to address the underserved needs of, of people both in the US and globally. Um, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to get the perspectives of some folks who are looking at new models of innovation, as well as the perspective of, of one of the startups who's been successfully trying to figure out how to navigate and meet the needs of, of the underserved in the US. Um, and so uh, we're gonna start by giving a little bit of context uh, to, the, to this, the nature of this problem but both from, oh, we got the wrong presentation. Could we put the, um, is it possible to put the international presentation first, right? Yeah, the startup bootcamp one. This is a sneak preview. Yes, yeah, it's a sneak preview. Because um, we wanted to start by giving that perspective of, a glo of the global audience uh, of, and the needs uh, globally and then turn to the, the attention to the kind of the US market where we have the opportunity to hear from, uh, from a, a leader of one of the startups that's doing some really interesting work. Um, so we, uh, I wanna thank uh, David True and others from MyPay who have uh, been facilitating this series of, of these discussions around various topics and turn it over to um, some of the folks who are, are gonna be speaking tonight. Um, the first is uh, Edwina Johnson, who's the program director of Startup Bootcamp FinTech New York, and has recently moved here from London. Uh, so she brings a, 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 an interesting and wonderful perspective of kind of the, the world just outside. For this no, just for this event. Just for this event. <laughs> um, and then we will hear from um, Asad Ramzali, Ramzan, Nali, sorry, I butchered that. Um, senior manager of financial, the Financial Solutions Labs at the uh, Center for Financial Services Innovation, which has been focused on meeting the needs of the underserved uh, in, in the US. And then last but very, not least um, is um, Katie Mishko, um, of, who's the COO of uh, One Financial Holdings, otherwise uh, who has a wonderful product in the market called B Accounts. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we will, we are live streaming this event. Um, so if you want to do an immediate action or interact with the other participants, we encourage you to use the hashtag on Twitter, NYPAY, N-Y-P-A-Y. Um, if you are participating in the live stream, or and certainly you're welcome to in the room as well. And then we will be, um, we will be looking to pull in the, the conversation uh, into the audience and get pr your perspectives in, in the course of the discussion. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much. Lovely. Is it possible to move on to the other presentation? Sorry, we have two. Yes. I think it was the first one I sent to you. Um, what I can, if that's well, not, no, no, it's, no, it's not here. no. Yeah. that's for me. Um, well, do you want to flip it and I'll maybe yeah. start the reverse? Totally. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with this one. Um, <laughs> You want to go full screen here? All right, my name is Asad Ramzanali. <clears throat> As Maria mentioned, I work at an organization called CFSI, the Center for Financial Services Innovation. We're focused on improving financial health of, low, of uh, underserved Americans, and one of the ways we do that is by investing in and supporting startups that advance that mission. So I want to talk a bit about our work and how we view the world. Um, next slide. Next slide. 
Okay. Uh, so a bit about the program, the Financial Solutions Lab. We are a, we're structured almost like an accelerator, but it's a little bit longer and we do different things. So it's an eight month program, largely virtual. Uh, we meet with the companies every six weeks or so for two days at a time. These are companies who are a little bit further along than accelerator stage. So we actually really uh, enjoy the fact that something like Startup Bootcamp uh, and Wiener's program exists because those companies come out a lot stronger when they've been through something like that. But what we offer is money, uh, expertise about the industry. So we get pretty into the weeds about what's going on in financial services uh, and then exposure to the industry, right? And that's where we're most helpful. We aren't good at a lot of the things that other programs are good at, like how do you hire your first engineer? How do you think about your first round of funding? We don't focus on that as much. When startups have those questions, we will help find resources for those. But we focus on the really wonky end of FinTech financial services questions. Next slide, please. Um, so the Financial Solutions Lab, you may have seen the logo, come, uh, is a partnership between JP Morgan and uh, CFSI. CFSI, we are a nonprofit focused on these issues. Um, tactically, our work kind of falls into a couple different buckets. We do research, consulting, we invest in startups, we have a policy arm. I think what's most interesting is to give you guys a little bit of flavor of our research, because that really helps frame how we think about uh, the types of startups that we want to work with. Uh, next slide. So this is one of our seminal studies, the Consumer Financial Health Study. What we did is we looked at, uh, we, we did a nationally representative survey of the U.S. and said, what's going on with people's finances? We're a number of years out from the recession. How are people feeling about things? What does that actually mean for their day-to-day -day spending habits? Uh, and we can talk about the methodology in detail later if you'd like. But the short answer is 57% of Americans struggle financially. That's bigger than the other numbers you might hear, like the number that are underbanked, an issue that B goes after, or the issue, or the number that are thin file or no file, right? So they have difficulty accessing credit. Uh, this is a bigger bucket. Uh, those groups are probably subgroups of this, but we think about this in a number of different ways. Uh, but the short of it is, it's one out of every two Americans. This is not a niche problem. This is not a small industry. Next slide. Um, and what that means for market size, right, this is a market, uh, it's $141 billion. So the underserved in America spend $141 billion on fees and interest every year. That is a massive market if you're an innovator trying to get into this, right? This is an area where there is money to be made. Now, you can argue academically, and trust me, we do, um, whether this is too big, should this market be smaller? Right? There, there a lot of terms get thrown around that, that we, uh, we struggle with at times. We don't use the word predatory too often right? because we think there are market solutions and there ought to be better ones. Um, but, but it's something to think about. Where's that money actually going? And you can tell that a lot of it is in credit, a lot of it's in payments. Uh, there's other products and services. When you break out the actual products, overdraft makes up a big percentage of this, overdraft fees. Um, so that's the market. Next slide. Uh, but what I find more interesting is the humanizing element. So um, we, we, CFSI and NYU's uh, Financial Access Initiative did a comprehensive study of over 200 families uh, throughout the U.S. that looked at what, what are these problems day to day? What does this actually look like for a family? So they profiled these 200 families, and the book just came out. It's called The Financial Diaries. I recommend picking it up. But one family that was profiled uh, that's really interesting the Johnsons, uh, Sam and Sarah Johnson, they live uh, outside of a major city in Ohio. We changed some of the details to give them some anonymity. Um, but on the outside, they look like a typical middle-class American family. They have three dependent children. Uh, both of them have full-time jobs, and they have an additional part-time job to supplement that income. Um, but they struggle financially, and it's not because they don't make more money than they spend in a year. It's because the timing of that is really off. Next slide. And so I'll quickly talk about that. This is what their income looks like on an annualized basis. This is real money going in and out of their accounts, or just going in. This is just the income side. You can see the couple of spikes, right? And that relates to tax refunds, that relates to hours worked, it relates to a lot of things. But it's hard to plan when your income looks like this. Um, and it's also hard to relate to, I'm gonna make an assumption, for most of us in here, who your income probably looks like this throughout the year, may maybe one bonus, may maybe one tax refund or paying back, but it doesn't look like this. Uh, this is what many Americans' lives look like. And if you go to the next slide, uh, this is what their expenses look like. And those two things don't match. 
And that's on a monthly basis. If you break it down on a weekly basis, it's even more difficult uh, to solve the cash flow problem. Right? So this is the kind of this is the worldview that we bring to the table. And this is the kind of expertise that a lot of our companies look to us uh, to inform their work. Um, this is the, we see it as the framing for how we think about investing in startups. Next slide. So we've now done two cohorts of companies. Uh, so we've invested in 18 companies. Uh, B is on there. We're, we're proud supporters of them. Um, but a number of companies that are doing really interesting things. Everything from uh, Digit, which is a savings tool, which some of you, is anyone here a user of Digit maybe? Okay, I know they've gotten some negative press recently, so don't kill me over that. But, um, <laughs> but everything from that to Remedy, which helps you rectify errors on your me uh, medical billing, right? It turns out like almost one out of two medical bills has some kind of error. Guess what, it's rarely in your favor. Um, so all types of companies that are helping Americans improve financial health. Um, and then next slide. So the last thing I'll do is a shameless plug. Uh, if you have a startup or know a startup that's in this space, you should pull out your phone and tell them to apply uh, because our deadline's in a few hours. We're, we're, um, I'm based on the West Coast, so it's midnight Pacific, so you've got a few hours. Um, but it's a really easy application. I, we, we have designed it to not be too difficult. We don't want your like prose and essays. Um, but yeah, would love to talk to you about the program. Looking forward to the panel, and I will hand it off to Edwina. Thanks very much. Okay, hi guys. Whilst my lovely presentation loads, um, yeah, I'm Edwina. I run the Startup Bootcamp FinTech Accelerator here in New York. I'm here with my colleagues, Bruno and Fleur, if you have any questions for any of us later. Um, we, so what I wanted to do was tell you a little bit about Startup Bootcamp uh, in uh, the accelerator and then frame why we talk about financial inclusion and why this is important for us and what it actually means for us in this accelerator space. Okay, so first up, hands up if you're familiar with an accelerator. Okay, awesome. So Startup Bootcamp is definitely a traditional accelerator. So we sit right on the end of the scale where we have a really high selection process. We look at about 400 startups each year. And out of those 400, we'll take 10 into the accelerator. Uh, and the accelerator itself is a three month period where we sit the entrepreneurs and the startups in the same building as us and we run a really intensive educational program. We bring in mentors from the community and we also bring in a number of corporate partners that we have within that accelerator to work with them. So we're looking to kind of upskill them on the business side, educate them on, on what it means to have a company and grow uh, and also bring in those opportunities to get revenue and traction so that you can fundraise and have a successful business after. Afterwards. Um, and we have mentor and alumni in the audience tonight as well. So yeah, lots of people you can talk to about what we're doing. David's just waving from the corner, slightly coy fashion. Um, <laughs> so although we're in New York, we also have, um, if we go on to the next slide, um, we actually have 19 accelerators now worldwide. And they're not just focused on fintech. So six of our programs are fintech, and those are Mexico, New York, London, Mumbai, Singapore. And we also have a fintech cybersecurity program in Amsterdam. Um, and then we have accelerators across the board. So things like digital health, transportation and energy, IoT, um, and the whole, and each of these runs these three month programs, bringing in high quality startups and also industry partners so that we're both supporting startups and helping industry players grow and evolve. Um, and from, so we are, so we're looking at fintech and we're recruiting internationally in each of our accelerators. So although we're based in New York, we will recruit from across the globe in the same way that each of these accelerators is. So it gives us at the end of the day, a really um, global view of that early stage innovation that's coming through fintech, um, particularly as we are focused predominantly on pre-seed startups. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a review that not many people have. Um, it's mainly you start to get picked up on, you know, AngelList or CBSI um, Insights if you're uh, raising money or, or kind of getting a little bit further down the line. So it is pretty unique um, data set. Um, and there was something else. Oh, and uh, so in terms of, I should say that unlike Assad, we are not solely focused on financial inclusion. 
So we will be looking at any technology startup that's relevant to finance. Um, but it does mean that we pick up financial inclusion startups within our programs. Um, and it kind of gives us an indication of what's happening, where it's evolving, what's going on. Um, so in particular, we could, well, we can see how the view of financial inclusion is changing and what kind of trends are coming up within it and, and how that's progressing. So what I wanted to do today was share our application data for the New York program from last year. So you can see where we get applications from. And then I want to dive into that to highlight some of the financial inclusion elements within that. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, this is a beautiful pie chart of all of our applications. And being in New York, the majority was in investment technology. Um, then we had payments, which we know is always kind of strong. That's one of the leaders in the fintech space. Uh, and then we had other interesting areas. And I've got a build on this, which is going to be irritating for you. But if you could hit uh, the next slide button. Oh, no, it's all come together. Great. Um, okay, so, so when I was looking at financial inclusion, what I wanted to do was kind of pull out where we're seeing financial inclusion. So investment technology. 27% of our investment technology startups were looking at robo-advisors. Um, and this isn't, this isn't exactly financial inclusion, but if you think about it, it's uh, some of those robo-advisors are helping, uh, helping people access financial services that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So it's a little bit tenuous, but you can see that some of the players are moving into that. When it comes to payments, we had 15% out of that 22 that were focused on remittance um, and 10% were on alternative payment gateways. So helping people, uh, unbanked people, get into the payment gateways. Uh, in terms of remittance, we're all fairly familiar with remittance startups and innovation, but we did see this year more of a trend on B2B remittance, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, Banking technology, 13% of our 17% of applications were focused on new challenger banks. Um, and again, this is something we're seeing in different markets worldwide, but they're specifically banks being developed for target audiences that aren't getting access to those banking services. Um, I'm going to come back to f consumer finance. And we have things like alternative lending. And within that, there was a large portion which is on alternative credit scoring. So how can you assess people's credit worthiness in different ways using different data sets and different metrics which are available? Um, also, within alternative lending, obviously, you had marketplace and platforms um, and different ways of accessing credit in itself. If we go on to the next slide, we're going to um, break out consumer finance a little bit more because this is where in the New York applications, we're really seeing financial inclusion. And we're seeing financial inclusion being defined more as um, consumer finance or, uh, or financial wellness. Um, and these things all really fit into it. So within this pie chart, we've got automated financial wellness. So this could be a layer that you put over your um, uh, account services where they are saying, you know, every month Edwina, You've got bills to pay on X, Y, and Z. So when your paycheck comes in, you know, portion this off, spend, you know, pace your spending, et cetera. Um, Goal-based saving tools. If you want to go on holiday, how can we motivate you through gamification of our app or through social sharing tools? Um, get your friends involved, help you kind of motivate you. Um, automated investing, helping you save money, helping you build up um, uh, 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 cash there, uh, other savings, uh, budgeting, budgeting is 4%. Um, but really, like, this is a really growing area that we're seeing recently. If we go on to the next slide, this is, so I just wanted to, uh, kind of from our London and Singapore program, who've been going for uh, three and two years, two and a half years, respectively, just talk about some of the things we're seeing there. So, Really interesting, from the applications to our London accelerator, 12% were from startups from incl financial inclusion and well-being, which is a huge number, so it's definitely picking up traction. Um, and in Singapore, 14% out of all the applications were focused just on remittance. So again, really like interesting themes coming through. And I think, you know, the... We, we can, I mean, you can go into lots of details on the different markets, but I wanted to highlight Cambodia, where we've been going and scouting for startups recently. 17% um, of people in Cambodia have a bank account, and 0.2% have a credit card. It's a huge opportunity to do something. It's like massive. Um, and in Europe, you don't think, you know, you think everyone's kind of, I think we used to think about uh, financial inclusion in terms of developing markets, and now it is more about financial wellness um, within somewhere like Europe. So, 
you know, we know there's a, a lot of immigration and migration going around in Europe. So there's an estimated 30 million Europeans on the move. And a lot of them struggle to get bank accounts in the new countries that they're moving into because you don't have utility bills, you don't have that credit history. So how can you help people like that? Uh, and then also from working with people, uh, working with our financial institutions in the UK, we know that from Lloyds Banking Group, um, that financial stress is one of the top uh, mental health issues in the UK at the moment. So again, just thinking about how you can support uh, people and help them manage their finances a little bit better gives them different opportunities. So it's kind of thinking about financial inclusion in a different way. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions, myself, lots of people in the audience, and, uh, and yeah, and obviously the panel now. Thank you. So um, thank you for that, because I think the idea was just to give a little bit of context before we all sat down and started to talk a little bit as a, as a group about what uh, the work, um, and also introduced uh, Katie um, Mishke, 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 Mishke. oh my gosh, it's so never going to get it, um, to kind of provide the perspective of someone, you know, who's working in the, uh, in, helping to shape a startup that's working in this space mm -hmm. uh, to address the needs of, of the underserved. And so I um, wanted you to give you an opportunity just to a little bit introduce what, uh, what B does. Sure. And then we'll start talking about some of the themes. We wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of the industry and how it's shifting. And we obviously have some, some data points that were shared. And then uh, talk about how, what are the best ways to really understand and meet the needs of the of, of those who are underserved. So I'll sure. take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. <laughs> um, so B is fundamentally, we're a mobile app, a mobile uh, connected to a Visa debit card. Um, and so we're a replacement for a checking and a savings account. We're an alternative. And we really compete with a whole bunch of markets. So um, what you saw from, from the previous presentation was that uh, the amount of fees paid across a whole bunch of areas uh, is pretty significant. And so we can compete uh, with bank accounts where people have massive over... Um, uh, Overdraft. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Overdraft fees. Uh, I hope it's not catching. Whoa, yeah. Uh, massive overdraft fees. Uh, we compete with check cashers who charge uh, large percentages of, of, of checks uh, to, for, to cash them. We compete with prepaid debit cards. And we compete with those who don't have an account at all, who so today may live in the totally cash economy, um, uh, which has its own risks and problems associated with that. So we compete about across all of those and can provide uh, these services. And our, our fundamental idea was that uh, if we replace the retail banking location with technology, we can reduce the cost and thus pass that savings on to the customer. So it's an incredibly low cost option for, um, I think we, we serve both the underbanked and those who actually have had a bad experience with banks who get charged a lot through banks. And so, um, so that's our, ba our basic concept. Uh, you can, you know, if you want to go download our app, you can check it out at B account. You just search for it in the Google uh, Play or, or the iTunes app. Um, and, you know, we, we provide uh, a portion of services really that we think are core to a customer's financial needs at the beginning. So you can deposit checks, you can do direct deposit, things like that. Um, and, and hopefully as we build, we can build onto that for, for other services. That's the basics. Great. So um, you touched on this in your presentations, and even the description of the services that B focuses on is is broad in terms of really getting to the the making sure that you know the, the needs of somebody who might have been had access to financial services but just not had an experience that made met their needs. Um, how how do you guys think of the definition of financial inclusion? And you know what is several of you guys mentioned the question of financial health and the impact on stress and sort of the relation those number those relationships. How is it shifting from perhaps the way that we might have thought about it two three years ago? And um, and what's driving it? Um, so CFSI has been around for. 13 or 14 years now, um, and it came out of the original research that said this idea of the underbanked or the unbanked is not just a developing world issue, it's also an issue in the US. That was kind of our, our formation. Um, and so for years, CFSI was focused on putting a spotlight on that issue, telling the industry that this is a group of consumers 
uh, that needs focus, that needs attention from financial services providers. Um, we, we don't talk about our mission that way anymore. Um, and part of that shift, this is probably three or four years ago, so a little bit before I joined. Part, part of that shift is when you say unbanked, when you say underbanked, um, there's a couple problems with that. A, you're, you're talking about a problem, not a solution. And everyone can kind of nod their head and say, yeah, that's a problem. We care about it. I totally agree. It's a, it's a problem we need to fix. Uh, and B, it insinuates that you give people bank accounts and the problem's over. Um, so our, our language has shifted to the solution, which we think is improving financial health. We do still think that the 8 or 9% of Americans that completely lack banking services, the unbanked, uh, that's, that's a major problem that we need to focus on. The 25% inclusive of that 8 or 9 that are underbanked, we think that's a huge problem. Right? But as, as even B is talking about this, there are people who are overbanked, whose services don't match their needs. Uh, I'd argue I'm in that camp, right? Like, I don't know that my checking account actually makes sense for how I live my financial life in some ways. Um, so it is a broader thing, and we do think about it uh, impacting most Americans. Yeah, I, th I think, as I mentioned, we've definitely seen uh, financial inclusion move from the developing, kind of a view of it being for the developing markets um, and into for people and consumers around us and, and how do we kind of get access to different financial services and also um, educate people and provide. Um, I think we've also seen quite a few trends towards both targeting younger generation and getting them more aware of financial services, as well as older generations who are perhaps not being able to access some of the new innovation and new technology that's around financial services as well. So kind of thinking about people on the spectrum as well as the educational front. So really, it's interesting because it really is the question of the understanding the particulars of people's needs as opposed yeah. to perhaps the supposition, which was, I create a generic set of financial services and that should do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, from a, as, as the needs, you, the understanding of the needs has shifted, how, is there any shift in terms of the funding models um, in the U.S. and internationally that have, have they paralleled? Is there, is there a parallel or is it, you know, how would you describe this, the funding models that are going on right now, perhaps in the work that you're doing? Mm. Um, and, you know, you're working in the case of uh, CFSFI in partnership with a larger financial institution. Is that, does that model seem to be persisting? Are there others? What, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different models you're seeing? Mm. And in, in terms of, um, kind of funding of those innovations yes. and getting yeah I think it's really interesting over the last probably year or so and I'm, I'm this is definitely from a European perspective because I'm yet to get fully up to speed with the US but uh, we've seen increasing amounts of um, funds angel groups or venture funds who have a specific um, social responsibility focus or um, a second line so looking for a turn and also social responsibility which is quite new and it didn't really happen before. Uh, and then in terms of that growing awareness of um, your local community and the people around you who need financial um, access to better financial wellness, um, more of the large corporates getting into that and kind of taking a focus on how they can help. So someone like, um, I think it's Lloyd's or it could be Barclays in the UK, has repurposed a whole bunch of their closed um, branches. So they've because there's more people going online, they've had to shut down bank branches, but actually they've reopened them as educational centers to help people learn digital tools and particularly around financial wellness. That's great. Yeah, That's yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd, I'd echo that we are also seeing a number of investors who care about a social mission. But, but I, I think one trend that's stronger that, at least from our, our vantage point where we sit, um, we're seeing mainstream investors and corporate partners start to care about this issue because the business model is becoming a little bit, it's, it's better articulated, it's clearer, um, and there's, it's, it's running into that kind of natural zone of risk taking that venture capitalists will, will start to touch. Um, it is still difficult for companies who serve uh, low income Americans to go to the richest venture capitalists in America on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley and say, this is why you should fund our company, right? But there, there is still a disconnect in just understanding. Uh, but just today, one of our, one of our portfolio companies, Propel, um, announced a funding round. Propel helps people manage food stamps. 
it's actually really difficult to live on food stamps, uh, not just because you're, you're not making enough money and you have to live on a budget, but it's also hard just to know how much is left on your, your debit card that food stamps are provided on. And Propel just provides an easy layer on top of that. Uh, they just announced a round led by Andreessen Horowitz, um, one of the best investors in the world, right? Think about that. Andreessen Horowitz is funding a company that helps people with food stamps. Uh, that's cool. Um, the wave of fintech investment that we've all, you know, I, I think everybody here has a sense of that uh, in the last maybe 24, 36 months. That wave has been great, but we also see that the, the, the wave for consumers that have been held out of the value of innovation, we're, we're seeing that wave start to hit them as well. I was going to echo that exact thing. And you can see it, um, actually, so, so the, the size of market that you put up there is really telling. It's, it's a, it's, if you can build the right technology uh, to serve this, the market is big enough and you can make a margin off that um, even at super low cost. And so uh, it just makes business sense at some point, right? But, but the technology had to meet the, the need and you had to have the flexibility and be able to build that. Um, and I think the other really interesting thing is, uh, so we started with a, an alternative to a checking and savings account, but there's lots of other business, um, businesses going after a similar market, starting with other pieces of financial life. And um, the idea is if you can serve, if you can reach that customer base and find that customer base, there's value across all bu a whole bunch of other financial products, insurance, micro et cetera, et cetera. So um, once you have the, the, the population uh, uh, paying attention and watching what you're doing, um, you can serve them in so many other ways. And now that we can serve them cheaply with technology, uh, you can really, uh, it makes business sense to get there. And I, th I think that's what you're seeing with, with Propel. Oh. David, do you have a question? Always. <laughs> the last 12 months in both the UK and the US have had political events that have raised awareness, I think, of segments of the population that maybe fall into some of these frameworks we've talked about, you know, living sick, health, sick, little, the sick little nature of their income. Do you, and you just mentioned that, uh, you mentioned financial stress. And uh, you just mentioned that Andreessen Horowitz had just uh, decided to fund Propel. Do you think that that changed awareness of parts of our respective populations? Is changing the way one might present, pitch, market the products and the way they're perceived by investors? So I'm just going to do a slight repeat just for those who might be on the, the, uh, on the web website. That's true. So essentially, uh, based in the environment of, of, of some, some seismic uh, political shifts in, in both in the uh, UK and US markets, raising awareness of the needs, uh, the more diverse needs of some who have been perhaps not as, not as key much of a, as, as acute a focus in the past, um, and how, how has that awareness perhaps contributed to rethinking of the opportunity in this space? <laughs> you go first. Okay. Brexit yeah. happened first. Oh. <laughs> Still raw. <laughs> um, so, so you, Brexit, yeah. So that that has had some other implications in innovation. Uh, it's an opportunity to be had. <laughs> And we're yet to see how all the regulations and stuff plays out, but I think we'll touch on that later. Um, but definitely in, in terms of uh, other, you know, other world uh, shifts within, you know, the European landscape, we've seen so much around migration. We've seen so much um, in the press um, and it, that plays into the political scene. And it's very much in the newspapers, it's in the headlines the whole time. And that does bring to mind this market and this need. And that has made more innovation for these, um, for these people on the move. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, on that last slide about the number of people moving from country to country within Europe and how you can, um, help them and have a, a better life moving from one country to another as well. So it's definitely played out. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that it's had a direct effect. Uh, so, so specifically, the election of Trump, the rising understanding of like the issues of hillbillyology, right? That that book from J.D. Vance that everyone kind of gets that idea. I, I don't know that that's had an impact on venture capital. Um, it has had an impact on what they tweet about. It, it has had an impact on what they say on panels like this and start to express their opinions. But at the end of the day, these are financiers, 
right? Like they take money from limited partners and they put that money to use by investing in startups. And if they don't think that startup has a chance of returning an outsized amount of capital back, they're not going to invest in it. Um, that model, I don't think has been shaken, uh, at least by this like rising awareness of a set of issues that wasn't talked about. Now, personally, I'm, I'm glad that we're starting to discuss these issues, um, but there is, um, I think there are secondary effects, right? If the administration comes out and uh, I, I know, I know you wanted to talk about this later, but the administration comes out and like starts to undo Dodd Frank, right? Yes, that could have some effects. Or uh, if we really get into the wonkier side of things, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, the OCC, which is the chief what bank. Favorites? What's that? One of my favorites. One of your favorites. <laughs> yes, top three. Um, <laughs> if they they're working on a fintech charter right now, if they uh, if they go through with it as has been proposed in their recent manual that was released, that could be really interesting. But there are ways they could do that that could also have a chilling effect for earlier stage innovation that I start to worry about a bit. Right, if this becomes a, you need to have this charter, which only a later stage firm could get uh, because of capital requirements, sophistication of compliance. If, they, if it seems like you need that to be legitimate in the space, uh, then I start to worry that everyone who's before that is going to struggle. Um, so, so there are these types of effects that uh, do have implications on our space, but I don't know that the, like, the rising political conversation is directly impacting, at least from what I'm seeing, venture investment. I, I would just add that the same way that we don't actually talk about our customers as underbanked or um, we, we, we talk about our customers, or they, they have, uh, it's our customers don't have the right financial tools today and we can help them get those financial tools cheaply. Um, and so when you see the, the, the size of that population that isn't just the poorest of the poor, it's in fact a broad swath. I think that, I think maybe the, the uh, election brought to the, like made people believe that. Um, m maybe it sort of helped that, but really, I, I really actually think we intentionally talk about our customers as low and middle income, not as underbanked, um, because it is really, we can help serve a broad set of people. Uh, it's, it's really anyone with a smartphone. And it turned, I mean, the thing I should have said before is that the other thing about technological advance is that even the poorest of the poor have smartphones today. Um, even if they don't, we talked about access to Wi-Fi, even if they don't have access to Wi-Fi, they may still have a smartphone. Um, it may be a, you know, a brick unless they're in a public place, but, but that access and that, that, that just makes me believe that, that we can reach that audience and we can, we can sort of get a margin off that audience. And, and I think that's way more compelling, actually. Yeah. So um, I was actually, I think your point about sort of the, the regulatory environment um, and one of the things that you were observing is actually one thing I wanted to highlight that I've always been fascinated by the model that the UK has taken in this space around, you said it's sort of less important the political label, it's more what the model allows in terms of innovation and partnership and kind of creative solutioning. Um, and I would love maybe for you to talk a little bit about some of the, we've had the sidebar conversation about the way in which the regulatory environment works with some of the innovation in FinTech mm -hmm. um, in the UK and, and how that, sort of a little bit describing that and what you, how you think that supports or how that, is there any shift in that and yeah. what are the lessons around meeting the needs of, of you know, the, the poorer middle class, you know, or the, that question of financial health. How does that play into the regulatory approach that's yeah. taken in the UK or that you've seen in Europe or other markets? Um, so definitely, so uh, the UK, so our main regulator has always been, uh, well, more recently has, has been um, very proactive in terms of learning about different financial innovation, um, learning what's out there, actively seeking engagement both with startups, but also larger players who are doing interesting things and bringing them in. Um, and through the European Union, we've had wonderful passporting and, <laughs> you know, and then like, it's brilliant. You can get a banking license and you can work in other countries with that banking license. And that was uh, one thing that I hope stays. Um, and that has been, it's been, <laughs> it's been encouraging. Um, and it means, yeah, so, and then more recently through the European Union, other regulations, so uh, the move towards open banking, uh, PSD2, this has really kind of, 
help people understand the opportunities and helping them really refocus again on the end user and the customer. Um, and if you, uh, if you can create a platform which is really user intuitive um, and just pulls in some of the banking data from the back end, which the customer has already set up, then you, uh, you gain the control of the customer, you gain control of... Um, uh, of that relationship, but you're also offering um, services which the larger players aren't able to do currently because they're not innovative enough, or they're not, sorry, they're not fast enough to execute some of those things. Um, so we have um, a whole number of challenger banks in Europe that have been set up um, who have, um, so things like Monzo, you know, if you lose your card, you can just go onto your app, you freeze your card, and that's it. It's done in, in like two seconds rather than spending half an hour on your phone to your bank trying to get through to the right person to freeze your card. And if you find it two seconds later in the back of your you know, handbag, you then have to go through the rigmarole of getting a new card rather than just switching it off. So I think if we, with basically with these regulations being um, opening up a whole new wave of innovation, I think there'll be more that's targeting different types of users and offering better um, uh, better. Uh, kind of user experiences, which you can then target towards different demographics who have struggled with the current financial setup. So quite a long answer. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so I mean, unless we wanted to touch more on the regulatory thing, I actually think your segue around you know, understanding uh, user experiences and needs was mm -hmm. actually the transition I wanted to make, which was, um, you know, once you get behind the beyond the concept of I want to address the needs of those who have not whose needs have not been well met, what are the most important elements of that of of getting closer to those needs? What is what what does it take to do that well? Um, and are there still important blind spots that we have, and and how do we overcome them? I can talk about it from our perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, initially. Our go-to-market strategy was we had uh, sales teams on the streets of New York and San Francisco uh, talking to customers every day. And it wasn't just our sales teams that were on the streets, but in fact, our development team, everybody on the development team had to go into the street, talk to customers. I think it was once a month or something. But uh, really, that feedback loop was crucial to understand where were the problems they were having, what were the issues. Um, at the time, you know, there's all these kinds of interesting things. We learned a ton about how people People use their phones, which was not an initial thing that we had sort of uh, set out to understand or figure out, but we had to understand how they use their phones to be able to understand, uh, gosh, they actually have two phones, not one phone. One is just for voice calls. The other is a, uh, you know, a, a has access to the, but only when they're on free Wi-Fi. Um, and so how do you manage between that when they can only get calls on one phone, uh, you know, but they actually have two different numbers. So we had to, we had to, uh, learn from that process of talking to customers, of seeing, uh, of seeing that. Um, and I think now we've moved to, uh, you know, a, a marketing plan. We, we, we don't have on the street teams. Um, it's a very expensive way to go to market, but you, we, I, don't, I don't think that we could know as much as we do now if we hadn't done that really street team process. Um, and so I think a lot of it is really talking to the customers, learning from the customers, uh, trying things out. I mean, it really is sort of like failing fast. So trying new, new pieces of, of, of the product. Um, there's all kinds of things we learned. I mean, the, the other key thing is like asking a customer when you sign them up, sort of what do you use today? And, and what, what are the, for us the big thing was what, what do you pay today to your current provider? So with prepaid cards, um, we also have an ability to, in the app, uh, say uh, lock my card so that nobody can access the card. Because there are some prepaid cards, when you lose that card, you lose the money on the card. And that just can't, you know, that, that is just, that can't happen for customers. That's just not not the right process. Um, and so by talking to a lot of customers, we could get there and learn these these various pieces. Um, but I would say, you know, we've we've done a lot of work. We we've we were selling on the streets for a year. We've now been in the market for uh, five or so months um, without our direct sales team, uh, and we have lots to learn. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, now we're learning. Uh, gosh, we, we know that we have customers who use our direct deposit. We know we have customers who use check deposit. We know we have customers who just use cash. They load their cash on. They take cash off. How do we help these customers, A, use their, uh, use their money, um, uh, lose less of it, if you will. So um, if you're a cash customer and you want to work in cash, that is okay. That's how you operate in your, your day. But if you load cash on at the beginning of the month, when you saw those uneven, uh, you know, you load when you, when you get paid. And then if you take out 18 times at the ATM, 
we charge you after the first two. So there's other ways that you, you know, we can teach you how to use this so that you can actually pay less. And so there's a lot we can continue to, to learn about that. Um, the, the other really interesting thing is, right, like different cohorts of people uh, based on age, based on sophistication, based on language, but there's all these various ways um, actually want to interact with their phone in a different way. And so we have to be um, continue to make the app uh, flexible enough to do, to do that. So um, I think there's lots of things yeah. to do, but without talking to the customer, I think we wouldn't have gotten as far as, far as we have. Uh, yeah, I, I think that is, uh, I think that has to be the answer for companies in this space. Uh, with one caveat, I, I think there are, um, within, within the types of companies we see, there are some teams who are solving for themselves in a way. Mm. Um, and, and when you do that, you can get away with not talking to the customer as much. W one example I'll give is um, a company we have called Support Pay that helps divorced or separated parents manage child support. Uh, it's really a communications layer on top of a payments layer because you don't want to talk to that person every day. Um, and, and so it's a really interesting product, but she is a child of divorce and herself went through a divorce. The founder, Sherry, did. Uh, and so she solved her own problem, right? Like that's what she was making. Um, but, but in the case that, you know, you're talking about talking to the customers, you, you can't get away from it. The, the flaw I see in that at the macro level is it leads to a bunch of tools for millennials, mm -hmm. uh, because the founders are these 25 to 35 Stanford grads, uh, right now. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Like, yes, please keep founding companies. But, um, there, there's an element of this that that leads to that being an overserved population for innovation, and the single black mother in the Bronx is not one that people are thinking about as much, right? So we we try our best to like highlight some of these populations, especially over the last few months. Uh, we need more innovation for the aging. We need more innovation for the disabled. These are not niche populations, by the way, right? Like these are massive, massive markets. Um, but yeah, I, I think you can't get out of talking to your customer, but also failing, trying new things and failing, right? The, the street team, you guys learn a ton, and like that, that is invaluable knowledge. Um, so, so I think those two things kind of have to go hand in hand. I would add one more thing, which is that our street teams were made up of our customers. So uh, the number of times that we hired people who were customers first and then came back to us and said, we really like the product, can we come work for you? We hired a ton of our own customers, so we were, so on some level, we could build for our yeah. own team. Uh, that wasn't the founding team, but but you know we 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 did hire our own customers as salespeople on the streets of New York and San Francisco, and so I think that helps to get. Uh, so I, you you raise a point that I wonder about a lot. Is dealing with a lot of uh, startup firms. The folks who start them, when the folks who start the firms are very different than the groups they intend to serve, how does one overcome that gap? Just to that point. And you've seen a lot of firms. I'm wondering how folks have been able to do it. I, so I, I have one example. So the question was, to repeat back for the mic, um, how do firms whose founding teams don't look like their customers, how, how do they get around that? Um, one example I'll give is a company called Even. Uh, so they're one of our first, they were in our first portfolio uh, or cohort of companies. Um, they help hourly workers um, smooth their income, right? So instead of you having... 30, week, 30 hours one week working at Starbucks and then 10 when rents do the week where you have 10 hours, right? That makes your life a little bit more difficult. Um, they will give you your average paycheck going forward, uh, save in the weeks you're above average, and then pull that savings to fill in the gap when you're below average, right? So you get what a lot of us are used to, which is an average paycheck. Um, those four, the, the founding team of four came from Instagram and other startups where they didn't know this problem as well. Uh, their first hire was a woman named Jane, who was a user researcher at Facebook. Their first hire was not a front-end app developer. It was not an engineer, it was a researcher. And they got a lot of heat from a lot of investors for doing that, right? Because when you're like a, a startup that doesn't have a ton of money, uh, that, that's an expensive choice. Um, that has been invaluable for their product development. Um, today, Jane, so, so she's a qualitative user researcher. She spends a lot of time talking to the users. You can go, they like publicize a lot of their insights, so you can go read her blog. Uh, today, what she does is whatever the team's gonna be working on the next day, she does a mini podcast for the team to listen to on their commute in. Literally hearing from the customers, right? So they have to, and that's expensive for a, a company, a team of like, they're probably like 12 or 13 now. For, for them to invest in that, that's expensive, but they have to. There's no way around that depth of knowledge. 
I would add uh, that yes, and absolutely yes. And I think, um, so interestingly, because we work with um, uh, kind of corporate industry partners, and most of our startups tend to be B2B, and actually most of our entrepreneurs tend to be a bit older coming out of the industry um, and have had experienced a problem. So many entrepreneurs experience a problem firsthand. So I think that is going to be the blind spot. You are going to miss stuff unless you empower different demographics to get involved and start innovating in the financial services space. Um, and that's why... We have challenger banks like Europe One who are targeting, uh, who are targeting those, you know, Europeans on the move because, um, I think probably large financial services guys, um, large banks are going, yes, these are our, these are our classic customers. You know, maybe we've got some segments in there, but they're not delving in and really understanding some of those different user groups, which other people are experiencing firsthand and wanting to target as well. So, I mean, there's, there was some important thinking around design thinking and really finding whether it's through hiring in your 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 knowledge base and 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 insisting on direct interaction whether it's through a research mode um, that's kind of ongoing, not one time. That's one thing I've always found is that there's this tendency to be like, good, we've done that. Now we can just build what we want. And the need is the need to understand the user interaction and needs is ongoing and forever, right? I'm, one of my questions for you guys is as you pull back, how do you replace yeah. that um, is it now that you have more of the diverse population in, at, at B that it's easier or how do you, how do you plan to continue to get, to continue to get closer? And then I'll touch on the question. I'd like to come back to the question of how do we build diverse founders? Um, anyway, that's a whole nother. Nut. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think, um, uh, one way we, we just have so many more users now that we can actually study our users. So we have a lot more data than we had before. Um, so we, we just have a lot of users, they're using our product, we can see how they use it, we can learn from that process. Uh, I think also, um, I mean, as we look to build out more products, I mean, one of the products we're, or a piece of the product we're looking at is, is a much more interactive product with the customer so that they can uh, talk to us more freely. But we have a call center, we have humans talking to our customers every day, so there's a lot of information in there that you can mine. Um, but, but I do think that actually as we go forward, our communication with our customers, and, and not just so that they feel great about B and get their problem solved as fast as possible, but that we learn, we continue to learn and push back. Um, I'm actually in the process of designing that, so <laughs> I'll tell you more later. <laughs> um, just a quick follow on that, because you talked about the interesting tension, and you guys may have thoughts on this as well, between the desire to meet the needs and then also um, some behavioral, whether it was around financial education, that, that might presuppose some behavioral change perhaps on the part of clients, where, you, where the example you gave was um, if they continue to take money out as many times, the 12 times a month, they're, they're having a negative impact to their financial health. Mm -hmm. How do you work on that combination of meeting their needs and yet kind of creating behavioral change that's ultimately positive for them? Because I think sometimes there's a, you know, tendency to sort of not, you know, sort of assume that we know what's best for you and how do you, that, that dance that yeah. you, you sort of meet them where they are, but try to encourage behavior that will ultimately be to their benefit. Yeah. Which I, I think can be a very fine line between uh, overly engineering and directing versus, uh, so I think that's a, a really good question. And um, so one is, uh, it turns out that you don't have to get cash from an ATM. You can also get it from cash back at lots of retailers and that's free. So we can teach our customers, hey, take cash out when you want, but here's a way to do it that's free. So, so there are other, it, it's really like one piece is giving customers enough information so that they can make the right decisions. Um, I think there is some amount of saying, uh, you know, and through our communication, through the app itself, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, size of, of, of withdrawal, things like that, that you could talk about, but actually, in this case, that particular case, just replace it with the cash back at a retailer and it's free and you don't have to pay for it. So there's an alternative. Um, but I think we're also, we, we are in the process of building some um, uh, 
sort of more automated savings products inside the app, um, which a customer can choose to use or not. So really, we're giving, you know, the power's all in the customer's hand, um, and, and we'll tell them what we're going to do. We're going to save a percentage of your inbound uh, revenue that comes in, and we can do it smartly because we see your, uh, uh, how much is coming in, and we, we see the past trailing 30 days, and we can, we can, we can do that based on that. Um, so we'll suggest a product that might help with savings, but not force it on. And so, uh, but, but I think there's more to be done, and we can, we can, uh, learn a lot more as we roll that first product out and then try some others. Yeah, I, I think that, that idea is, is, is really interesting. I, I do think there's a, a, a different answer based on, uh, for each company really, right, in each situation. Uh, Digit, for example, when, when, when they were first experimenting, uh, they're a tool that helps you automate savings. When they first uh, started, they can use basic uh, machine learning to look at your history, mm -hmm. your, your account history, and say, you know what, you're probably able to save $15 today and $7 two days from now, and you won't notice it based on your income and expense patterns. And so when they started out, they would ask the user, you should save $5, can I go ahead and do that for you? And, and that just didn't work, because most people are like, nah, I'd, I'd rather just leave it in there. So they stopped asking, um, and they just started sweeping that money aside said, you know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna automate the whole thing. And that's when they really took off, right? And so th there's an element here of, um, you have to continually learn and try new things, but at the same time, you may want to remove some of the control from the user, right? That uh, I, I actually don't need the knowledge of how much I should be saving, like if, if someone can just do that for me. A computer's better than that than I am. So there's sort of an opt-in that says, when you, when you start the app, you say, I agree that they will help me manage my savings. And beyond that, it, it just looks at your patterns and takes a selected amount. That's the whole product. There's no opt-in. When you, you use the product, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Oh, yeah. And their terms and conditions. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. no, no, no I, I see the point, though, because when you think about it too much, sometimes you make a decision that's not. Yeah. What? Oh, we're gonna get <laughs> David, you're being so naughty by asking all these questions without a mic. Um, so you're basically saying by by automating this process, you're you're allowing for a, a perhaps how they figured out that maybe we don't necessarily automatically make make the best decisions when faced with the equivalent of Nutella um, on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can see the calories there. <laughs> I know what that is. Um, so um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the models that sort of seem to be in a position to be more successful in scaling um, based on an understanding of, of, of the needs of, of, in this space. Um, which models have you found that you're sort of most excited about in terms of thinking about the potential to scale in ways that, you know, really address needs in an innovative way? Just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think there's two, I think about that at two levels. So I think there's uh, general financial services that need to be rethought in some way, right? And I think B is a good example of that. Of They're doing what we've expected of financial services, but just better, right? Like they just do it in a better way. They serve customers that have been uh, unserved, and I, and I mean that in the technological sense, right? Like they, they, they serve a new set of customers. Uh, and then there's a lot of these niche areas within financial services that people didn't think of as markets and didn't articulate payment flows, revenues, until recently, right? Like child support is one of them, where I, I assume this is a relatively educated crowd about financial services. You probably didn't know that tens of billions of dollars uh, flow between people in child support. Right now, she just articulated a portion, she being Sherry, the founder, she just articulated a portion of payments in a new way. Massive, massive business opportunity. So I think there's a lot of these um, new framings of markets that existed or finding niches that uh, are, are really fascinating and perhaps needed because a lot of the like higher level innovation is getting harder to find new, new ways of doing that. Uh, so, so we're excited about that. I, I think there's also like, there's a response of, of insurance we're, we're super interested in. We, we struggle with that a bit. It's, it's harder to, it's really hard to do that business. 
as a startup. It's really, really hard. Uh, but we like that people are trying, right? We're, we're excited about that. We're watching it. We continue to look at these companies very closely. I think you guys have done more, more work there. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but, uh, we continue to be very, very interested, but we haven't invested in an insurance play yet. Yeah, we love insurance. Uh, <laughs> we like, uh, I think because of our probably our, our leaning towards B2B startups, um, we like some of these slightly unsexy, challenging issues um, that are coming up. Um, but, you know, we could only... We can only start really working with insurance because um, the insurance players are realizing that they need to innovate and change. And, and they're, they're thinking about that because of, you know, the massive amounts of data that's now available through uh, various health tech startups and IoT and things. And how can they incorporate that and be clever and smarter about what they're doing? And if they're not going to change, one of the competitors is and, uh, and then they're going to be left out. So, um, but yeah, it's really, I think in terms of models, there's just so much there's, you know, um, that I, I guess just, you know, the user behavior, as you're saying, with the mobile phones, with the, um, the fact that people can access uh, Wi-Fi in so many places. It's driven that extra phone. Um, the fact that we're getting new um, innovation with AI, machine learning, blockchain. I think there's there's just so so much possibility now. And, and um, yes, I find it very exciting, but I don't know <laughs> if I could pinpoint to one that was going to be <laughs> stand out. Well, then I'll, I'll pick up on the idea about the partnership model, because uh, I was actually, I think I had a question about the partnership model with banks and other financial services, but you were talking about the the ideal, the sort of the, the need driving a partnership model or some sort of at least eyeing each other um, around insurance, and certainly CSFI has a unique relationship with, with Chase. Um, what in terms of the partnership models, what is the ideal role of a traditional financial services or insurance you know, provider in, in this model? If you could sort of ask them to do whatever it is that you want, what's the best, what's the, what are the, some of the best ways to, to support innovation in this space in a way that, you know, one of the challenges is that sometimes the business model, right, the, the reason why there's a gap is because it's been hard for some of these players to actually pivot and address these needs. So there's often a business model challenge for them to kind of allow this innovation or sort of watch this innovation happen. So what's the best way for them to partner? Um, sure. So uh, there's a, lots of different ways of partnering. Um, it could be through, you know, through putting cash in, through um, a venture vehicle and supporting a startup. It could be through um, uh, to kind of supporting them through mentoring or experts or advice um, or looking at some of direct commercial opportunities. And again, it might be more of a vendor relationship where a startup's coming in and selling their services and, and that bank's um, getting access to um you know, a new revenue stream perhaps that they haven't thought about, um, or they might have more of a partnership model where they're actually working with the startup to develop new technology and new opportunities in, in much more of a, um, a joint fashion than a vendor relationship. Um, in terms of my, how, you know, what would I like them ideally to be doing? Uh, to trying stuff, not, not being afraid of failing. Um, we spoke, and it's classic, but we spoke to a bank who said, yes, you know, this year we've had 60 pilots and all of them are a success. And it's like, no, that's not the point. <laughs> You've got to like test things that are going to fail and then you can learn from it. And the startups need to learn from that as well. You can't mark everything up as a success. Um, and just being focused in your engagement as well. So taking a small chunk, very targeted, just testing a use case so the startup can set, you know, work fast on that. You can move fast as a large organization and you get the learnings back quite quickly. Uh, yeah, I'd echo um, everything Edwina said. The one thing I'd add is I think banks are beginning to Beginnings are wrong. Banks are uh, doing a better job now than, than two years ago of creating an enabling environment for external innovation, right? I think there's a realization that um, there are just by you know, Chase has like 250, 300,000 employees, very smart people who can do good things. Uh, but there are many billions more that don't work at Chase. So just inherently, there will be more innovation outside than inside. And uh, there's a realization that there are economics to be had for banks um, if they can figure out that partnership model. Um, JP Morgan has been incredibly helpful for a number of our companies, and that is an enabling environment type of helpful where they can do mentorship or answer quick, really deep questions 
right? Where, where there is no way to look that up. There's no book about this, but the person who is on the board of Nacha, who happens to know your really wonky question about how ACH works, like in off periods, that kind of stuff, right? Where you have the knowledge and that's really helpful. I think that's one level of it. And then I think it'd be to cover like commercial relationships of being there to provide services uh, really directly, right? And, and in, in that relationship, it's the startup as the customer of the bank for banking services, for, uh, you know, providing prepaid cards or being the issuing bank or doing ACH transfers at, at a reasonable price. Those kinds of services that are just, it's banking services, right? We're not, we're not talking about like anything beyond that at that level. So I think there's a few things, but in my mind, it kind of all categorizes as enabling an external innovation and it's not altruistic. It is very much because there are economics, there are economic motiva- motivations for the banks to do it. Just, just an observation. Yep. I've worked at a couple big banks and startups like Serve, and uh, they're, they don't usually have the attention span. Uh, they have trouble with acquisitions mm-hmm. and getting new customers, and they use a lot of promotion to get the customers, mm-hmm. but then they don't know what to do next. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't have the commitment necessary. So it's interesting that they're changing their model a little bit. I don't think it's all banks, and I don't think that's true. Sorry, I, I don't think it's all banks that, that are doing this, and I don't think it's true at equal levels of depth, even within the ones yeah. that are. Uh, but I do think there's a growing realization, especially within the larger banks. May I ask just a follow-up question with that, with the, uh, the, the model of so That seemed from the outside a really interesting move. But also having worked at American Express for a while, I wonder, is it the institutional culture, the, the being itself was, was not uh, accustomed to working with that sort of product, that sort of market? They bought a company, a uh, Steve Case startup called Revolution Money. Yeah. It, yeah. it was on 250 Hudson. It was in a long space. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they struggled. Uh, I have many personal thoughts on it, but it's just interesting. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of, and I've worked at Citibank too, but they're going to this more outside, helping foster and maybe invest a little bit with maybe you'll pay me back later if you're successful. I think that's the way it's going more. I, I had one, and I think one of the pieces of that is that if you have to, if you take an external uh, technology and try to incorporate it into an existing, I mean, the, they're behemoths and um, they've been patched over time and, and the tech, technological challenge of bringing in something like that is massive. You so by doing it outside. You want legal regulatory? No. You want, yeah. you take a startup and yeah. you're, you, you just overlay your compliance on yeah. it. And A, all the smart people will go quit because yeah. that'll drive them nuts. Yeah. But you'll also break the product. But and and you can uh, so if you let if I, I think uh, I think it is not every bank and I think um, or or forget banks it's not every large company that's yeah. allowing this innovation externally but um, you can often see especially with technological advances that if you let those happen outside and they build in their own um, I think there is a little bit of like hopefully we can incorporate some of this later hopefully we can build some of this but but if you build it inside you watch it happen with this technology um, and it was I mean this is sort of a little bit of tangent, but I, I was working at Bloomberg several years ago and um, we had the concept of building a, um, having a, a SWAT team that would work, li- li- we, we said, we have to remove them from the building. They cannot even be in the in the location because if they have to use the terminal infrastructure and use the terminal language, um, they will be building in the terminal, right? That's that's not what we're trying to do. Um, and it was too hard. It was too hard to do that. You can't, you, um, how would they connect in? How would you get it? So, so I think I think the problem of 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 that the technological challenge can be really really. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so okay, so, so we're. I, I was going to do one quick follow up there. Yeah. So so I, I this idea of like externalizing innovation with foosball tables <laughs> as a minimum. Um, as long as we have those. Yeah, that's so that solves all the questions, right? And and beer on tap that'll also help. Um, but, but I think one part of it is this, this broader trend in technology that we see with larger companies um, in a way outsourcing R&D. Like the Bell Labs of the world don't exist as much and mergers and acquisitions of startups in a way fill that role. Um, I think that's one part of it, right? I think the other part is you see a company like Lending Club, for example, that in and of itself can scale and banks can partner with them in a different way, 
right? I, I don't know that Lending Club is going to be acquired by a bank. It could, but uh, it's an interesting model where banks are participating in uh, in that model inherently, like they're they're part of it. I think we're going to start opening it up, but I kind of wanted, and this will actually come out to you guys as well, is um, one last sort of question was, are there, you know, learnings from sort of the international perspective that we, uh, that should be more brought across, uh, across the, you know, in the collaboration of meeting these needs, and then, and then kind of really for this group, and as well as from the folks in the audience, what does success look like in this space? And then, then we'll keep going out and we'll start passing it around. Okay. Um, uh, the, sort of how, how does international and domestic, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, okay, points, learning. Are, they, are they needs more alike than just dissimilar? Because we talked about the need to be yeah. very focused to really understand needs, but at the same time, are there learnings that could be shared yeah. across? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think some of the processes in terms of understanding an audience and understanding a need um, are the same, but clearly markets are very, very different. One takeaway would be um, the some of the regulations that we do currently have in the UK or in Europe from a financial side, bringing some of that thinking to the US, I think could be really beneficial. Um, and success is, you know, better meeting uh, user needs in, in different circumstances and different demographics. And then we'll definitely open it up from here. Yeah, I'll answer the second part of that. Um, I think success would be a, a vibrant marketplace of solutions that solve consumers' problems in a way that fits their lifestyles. Um, and I think we have a long ways to go for that. Okay, so uh, I think I may be a roving person somehow because I don't know how we'll do this with one mic, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Perfect. First of all, thank you. This was a fantastic discussion, everybody. Um, but this is a question for Asad. Two-part. First is, what is the source of the capital that you invest in these startups? Is it all from J.P. Morgan, or do you have other investors? And then the second question is, in the case of a startup you mentioned that is raising money from equities and Horowitz, is that something that you help facilitate, and is this part of the services that you include in your model? Yeah. Uh, so, so on the first, the, the first question was, where, what's our source of capital? Um, so, CFSI is has a lot of things going on. Uh, generally speaking, we have um, ongoing funders like Omidyar Network that fund a lot of our ongoing research. Uh, we have grant, we have like project specific funders uh, like the City Foundation that will work on a specific paper. Or a specific study. We get some of our money from consulting revenue, but that is all kind of ring fenced, or I should say the lab itself is ring fenced. That is all Chase money. So Chase gave a grant to CFSI. Uh, it is $30 million over five years to operate this lab. Um, and and that, is a, that is a donation. We are a nonprofit, right? And so we use that to then uh, capitalize the startups. Um, and I should say, I use the term startup loosely. We, we do both for-profit and non-profit innovators, early stage innovators. Uh, we have tended towards, and the model was designed for, uh, for-profit market-driven solutions. So our breakdown right now, out of our 18 investments so far, 16 are for-profit entities. Um, two are non-profit. Although when you're an early stage product, nobody's making profit. So it's kind of touchy. But um, that that's the first question. Um, and the second question was around the, uh, how do we help the startups when they're trying to get access to funding? We were designed to help with access and exposure to the financial services marketplace, to the regulatory community, to partners and vendors that know consumer finance. Um, that's what we're designed for and that's where we spend our time. Um, the fact that we had a successful cohort or first successful cohort, a byproduct of that was a deep, relationship with a lot of venture capitalists. Um, that byproduct has been helpful for a lot of companies. In that specific case for Propel, no, I, I don't think we facilitated that. Um, but we have facilitated a number of those types of relationships for our companies. We don't see that as our, our primary role. And oftentimes when I'm talking to startups, I'll say, if that's what you're trying to get out of this, like this is not the right program. Right, because like we're we're good, we we've become good at it, but that's not like where we want to spend a lot of our time. Uh, in fact, I, I'd argue start a boot camp would be much better positioned uh, for early stage companies for that. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> on that, I think uh, 
Yeah. So accelerators like ours, again, if someone says I'm coming to you to raise cash, how are you going to help me raise cash or what investment are you putting in? Uh, that's again, not the purpose of our program either. It's, it's, you know, the main benefit you're going to get for an accelerator like ours is uh, access to you know, the network and the expertise and the knowledge and the opportunities for the business. And that's kind of what we're going to provide. Next. Um, question on customer acquisition and gaining customer trust. Is me, for you, Katie. Um, so you talked about how you know customers have a range of financial needs that can be met by different products, and the, the point is about like, getting that relationship essentially with them, right? And given that again, the founders are probably going to be different from the customer they're trying to so, serve, um, and that this segment typically values face-to-face -face relationships, trust in the community, and so on. How do you think about be for instance reaching out to customers? Yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I wonder if the face-to-face -face is actually, if that is actually correct, that, that you were required to have face-to-face. -face. Just to repeat the question, it was sort of, um, when we think about our customer acquisition, uh, how, you know, how do, we, how do we think about that process? How do we think about them gaining trust, our customers gaining trust? And I think a lot of it is, um, I mean, first of all, our, all of our marketing looks nothing like, you know, Chase marketing. Um, we, if you look at our app, uh, that was actually our old logo on the slide. We should give you a new one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our new app is bright red, pink, purple. It's sort of like very out there um, and uh, is meant to be friendly. Uh, our our our, so <laughs> our customer support emails all start with hi. That's like the first word in every customer support email. So uh, it's just a different type of relationship with the customer. And um, I think in our marketing, we're trying to reach out to, to customers and get them to sort of say, hey, you know, make them think about the co what they're spending today. That, that's the main thing. It's sort of saying like, what, have you had an overdraft fee, right? Like, what, come to us, we, you will not have an overdraft fee. Um, how much do you pay in ATM fees? There, there's sort of a lot, a lot of questions you can ask customers, um, and if they answer them honestly, <laughs> we, can, we can give you a better, a better answer. Um, so I think a lot of that is that. And, and interestingly, I think uh, one of our early ideas was that, in fact, a face-to-face -face was required, that we're talking to a customer base that distrusts bank, that have had a bad experience, that maybe have never used a bank, and so they need, a face, they need to trust the person. And in fact, um, there was this amazing thing. If you had ever gone out with our sales team on the street, uh, we would repeat locations often. And, and if you went, inevitably someone would come up and say, oh, hey, Jerry, you signed me up like X you know, time ago. Do you remember me or something? So there was certainly a connection, but it's actually not required uh, to gain the trust of the customer. And I think uh, to to ensure that we have continued trust to the customer and that you know we convince them to sign up, but actually use the product um, and become a, a, a you know a producer for us, right? Uh, and and actually get gain value out of it is that we have to show them value through various methods, which is either. Um, Gosh, the, it's so much easier to, to to deposit a check because I don't have to go wait at the check cashers and I don't have to pay in in California the ten percent of face value or New York the two percent of face value. That in fact um, I, I can do it on my B app right there and it's a much lower cost. So uh, I think there's a lot of ways to to do that. Uh, the the other thing is we actually work with a, a number of partners as well. Uh, I think our our acquisition strategy is going to be much more on the marketing side, but we do work with partners who are already talking to these customers about other things. Um, to the value of what CFSI can do for us, uh, a lot of those partners are actually friends of CFSI or, or through CFSI. So we are par um, right now Propel uh, this is actually, they inside their app, they have um, sort of an ad for B saying, hey, sign up for B, here's what you'll get. So uh, there are other, you know, if you, if they trust another company and then they talk to their customers about B, that's another way to do that. But a lot of our, our customer acquisition is direct marketing, um, talking to them about the things that they're concerned about, I think. Okay. Other questions? Huh? Yeah, do you want to? Hi. Um, I'm gonna do a little plug-in. My name is Ugo Mbanugo, the CEO of Emali. We are into social savings uh, based on the concept of ROSCA, which is um, Rotating Savings and Credit Association, and it's been around for over 200 years. So you guys should look out for our application. It's coming out in two weeks. However, I have a question for Assad. I applied last year, I didn't get in. <laughs> thank God. No, thank God because I didn't know what I was getting into then. Now I know it, FinTech is really, really tough. But right now we are ready for that. 
So my question is this, with the $250,000, right, um, what kind of equity are we looking to give up? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, for 250000 what kind of equity do we take? Um, we generally deploy that capital for for-profit entities in what's called a convertible note. Some of you probably know what that is, but for the ones who don't, it's a debt instrument that converts to equity the next time the startup raises a round of equity. Right, so if we give, and, and, and the details are figured out with each company, um, but generally speaking, as a nonprofit, we see ourselves not, we're not venture capitalists, right? Our, our goal is not to return capital to limited partners. So we tend to have terms that are pretty founder friendly, pretty favorable. I'd say of the 18 companies we've invested in, I think we're the cheapest cost of capital for like 16 or 17 of them. Um, but that also comes with, we require that the companies work with us to define and then report on a quarterly basis consumer impact metrics. So those aren't public. You won't see B's impact metrics you know, in, in a report of ours. Uh, but for us as investors, we want to know, what are you doing for consumers' lives? That helps inform our research and our agenda as well. Other questions? <laughs> um, yeah, someone mentioned before about the OCC and maybe what impact would that have good or bad uh, on the fintech space in your opinion? So this is, yeah, um, I'm going to be careful to not wade into <laughs> territory that's detrimental for my, uh, my career here. Um, and my, yeah, okay. So <laughs> I think there's two potential things and then, and I will re, re caveat by saying this is my opinion, not like CFSI's stated uh, official take on it, things. Uh, one, I think it can be really good. So the OCC has put out a charter to have what's called a special purpose national bank uh, for fintech companies specifically. So a new type of banking charter. So you'd get all the access to, to payment systems and other things that banks have, uh, but it also comes with the regulatory um, needs and, and, and necessary parts of running a bank. Um, I think it can be great for a company that is already well capitalized and has a sophisticated compliance infrastructure. And if you have that today, it's hard to see the immediate value of the transaction cost. If you have that today, you've already figured out how to deal with 50 states. You've already figured out a lot of the things that are harder to see the value. But for the next crop of companies that gets there, I think there's value. Um, for a lot of these efforts, my bigger fear is that they define a box. And if you're not inside that box, um, it's hard to be seen as making progress. Um, so with the OCC charter in particular, I could see a world in which that gets put on hold because of administration pressures or Congress repeals the, the regulation as they have the, the right to do, from my understanding. Uh, if that happens, I could see a chilling effect on bank-like startups getting funded. Right, I could see venture capitalists who, you know, the generalist venture capitalists are not sitting there reading the OCC's National Registrar. They're just not doing that, right? So they see movement and they'll back away, right? Their immediate reaction is like, ooh, not going to touch that. Regulatory risk. Um, that's what I'm afraid of. I, I think the OCC has actually been relatively thoughtful about that, about not making this a mandatory route and leaving other routes open. So you could still go work with states. You could still work with banks. Um, so overall, good, but I, I think there's a lot of uh, thorns that you got to be careful with in, in designing such a, a program. And I'll, I'll make a NIPEG plug. We did an event, NIPEG did an event two months ago specifically on the charter. And it's up on our website, so you can dive into the, uh, the recording of it, the video, and see if it provides any other <coughs> There you go. Are there other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for providing really deep insight onto, uh, from a variety of different perspectives on the opportunity to meet the needs of uh, increased financial wellness, uh, both in the U.S. and globally. Thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for some great questions. Thank you. Thank you.